The Bible tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, and to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Join us now for the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Our study today is the Book of Daniel. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are so excited that each and every one of you have joined us again for another week of special exciting Bible study. Hasn't this been exciting? The book of Daniel. I love the book of Daniel. I love apocalyptic studies, last day uh, prophecies found in the Bible. And so the book of Daniel doesn't let us down in that area. And so we are so thankful again that you've joined us each and every week. We know that you could be doing something else, but you're here with us and we praise the Lord for you. Uh, before we go any further, I want to go ahead and introduce my exciting panel uh, because this this panel, I learn so much from each and every week. And so I want to start here to my left, Pastor John Loma King. How are you, brother? Good to be here. I tell you, I'm just Daniel 7 is what I have. That's just, oh. <laughs> I can't even you can read do this right now. Sleep. <laughs> I'm so excited about this chapter, so I'm going to just pass it off to Shane. <laughs> right. We're looking forward to it. That's Amen. Right. Amen. Brother Kenny, how are you? The excitement is just right. It's, it's catchy. I'll pass it on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Kenny. Oh, I'm, I love this book. Yes. And I love to study with each one of you. So Amen. it's a privilege. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. And I just want to remind you, if you want uh, to be able to study along with us, you got to get a study guide. And of course, uh, I always like to recommend going to your local Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, join in with a small group and study. They'll be able to provide a copy of the study guide for you. Uh, but if not, uh, we also can provide a way that you can get it for free if you go to mm. absg.adventist.org. Again, that's absg. Dot adventist.org and you can access the study guide online for free. And, uh, you know, there's so much to this study that I, I don't even really know where to start because there's, there's just so much to talk about. And it's like, man, how do I get through this in a timely manner? But nonetheless, uh, our, our study for this week um, is a powerful study in the sense that we're walking through the seventh chapter of Daniel. And um, I think it's vitally important that we understand this chapter because it certainly uh, involves much of what we're going to experience here in the last days. But before we go any further, we should obviously have a word of prayer. And so, uh, Ms. Shelley, would you have a prayer for us? Absolutely. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus to give you all honor and praise. Mm -hmm. And we ask, well, Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We thank yeah. you that uh, we can know that your prof prophetic word is sure. And we ask in the name of Jesus, you'll fill us with your Holy Spirit now. Speak through us mm -hmm. and give us all ears to hear mm -hmm. what the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Sunday's lesson, uh, I'm going to dive right into that just because the bulk of, of I think, uh, setting, this, setting us up for the content of the seventh chapter of Daniel uh, is talking about these four animals, these opening verses of Daniel chapter seven. And indeed, we do see four interesting animals. And it's interesting when you take on uh, the seventh chapter of Daniel, because up, uh, prior to this point, there's, I mean, there's been some Bible prophecy and you're going to see that Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven obviously correlate with each other. They parallel each other as far as some of the content. Uh, but, you know, the bulk of what we've been studying so far has not really been, uh, you know, what we would call, you know, clear prophetic or apocalyptic uh, nature of, this, of the studies that we've been doing. The apocalypticness, is that, is that a word, yeah. uh, <laughs> amplifies when we get to this chapter. And so we're definitely going to dive into this because right here in the opening verse of Daniel chapter 7, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Mm. And so he's in vision. God is literally rolling almost as if he's playing, uh, rolling a movie reel in his mind and he's taking mm. him from one scene 
to the next. And so what we're about to find out, and I like to see it as the Lord is simply taking Daniel and us through kind of a special little seaside safari ride uh, as we're about to <laughs> go through and see all of these different animals, which of course represents something. Yeah. And so uh, I want to start reading the chapter, the rest of this, uh, not the chapter, but the rest of these verses through verse seven, because the Bible tells us beginning in verse two, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my night, uh, in my vision by night and behold four winds of heaven were stirred up, stirred up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea each different from the other the first was like a lion and had eagles eagles wings and watched till the wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it verse 5 and suddenly another beast a second like a bear mm -hmm. It was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus to it arise, devour much flesh. Verse six, after this I looked and there was another, mm -hmm. like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. Mm -hmm. And then of course our seventh verse, it says, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. And so I just want to kind of go through and pick apart and provide some meaning behind these great symbols because now we're diving into the apocalyptic nature of this chapter in which there's heavy symbolism and we need to allow the Bible to interpret itself. So I want to start there in verse 2. First of all, we see right off the front, uh, the Lord is, is bringing a scene about to Daniel where the winds are stirred up. And of course, winds in prophetic language are symbolic of strife, war, bloodshed, and of course, destruction. And Jeremiah confirms this in Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 31 through 33. And obviously we're not going to be able to go to every single one of these verses that I'm going to mention, but I want to provide some references of study so that you can go back and watch this again and study it for yourself. We also see there's a mention of the sea. And so sea symbolizes multitudes of unconverted peoples who are inimical to the people of God. And so we see this in Isaiah chapter 17 verses 12 through 13 also uh, chapter 8 verses 7 through 8 uh, and so forth even Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 tells us that these seas represent multitudes of people hmm. and so when we go on to verse 4 obviously now these four beasts are, are, are mentioned to us they are introduced to us and we need to ask the question do these four beasts represent four kings or four kingdoms because a lot of people get confused on that. They say, well, it says king, but it doesn't say kingdoms. But the truthful answer is, is very simple. The four beasts represent four kingdoms, which were ruled over by a succession of kings. Okay, and we know we can find this answer in Daniel chapter 7. In this very chapter, yes. God doesn't leave us hanging in the 17th verse and also in verse 23. Right. And even over into Daniel 8, we see a confirmation that these beasts represent kingdoms that are ruled by powerful kings. Amen. Then we get on to verse 4. Here comes this first beast, this lion. And of course, we know that, again, parallel to Daniel chapter 2, there are four medals. And how many beasts are in this chapter? Four. four. There are four beasts. And so each medal in Daniel chapter 2 represented a kingdom in the succession of the rulers of the world from one nation to the next. We see this exact pattern. And this is that repeat factor that we're talking about. So far, what, what my portion of the lesson is and what Sunday's lesson is doing is repeating exactly what God has already covered in Daniel chapter 2. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, by the time we get to Pastor John and down, we're going to see that he's going to expand mm -hmm. from uh, these kingdoms. But nonetheless, we have this lion. And so who is this lion? Well, just as the head of gold represented Babylon in Daniel chapter 2, Obviously, this lion represents the kingdom of Babylon as well. Uh, Babylon was the supreme kind of nation. They had everything supreme. Gold is the most precious metal in Babylon. The lion, of course, is the king of beasts. The eagle is the most uh, is, or excuse me, the king of the birds, etc. So we see that everything is great in abundance in Babylon. And even in archaeological uh, excavations uh, have proven that lion sphinxes were, on the, were very common in ancient Babylon, uh, plastered to the walls and throughout the palaces. Jeremiah even affirms in the Bible, so we don't have to go very far to see that right here in the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7 and also Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 17, we see that Jeremiah actually links Babylon to being a lion. And of course, the wings represent swiftness and conquest. Mm -hmm. Babylon was quick, 
But we're going to see another kingdom comes along that's even quicker than Babylon yeah. in conquering the known world at the time. A lion with a man's heart, of course, is cowardly. Uh, no, no lion wants a man's heart. A lion wants a lion's heart, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like Richard the Lionhearted. He was a brave, brave man. Uh, and, and so we see that uh, Babylon's cowardless is clearly displayed by King Belshazzar, who was the last king before they fall, of course, when the kingdom fell to the Medes and the Persians. So clearly this first beast is no doubt Babylon. Then we go on to verse 5, where from this point, you're just simply applying history. But, you know, even if you didn't even have a history book, Brother Kenny, mm -hmm. you could just go to the Bible. God tells you which kingdoms come after the other. Yeah, and right. then we just, we match that with the Bible and we see how it just goes like a hand in a glove. It's beautiful because we know historically, yes, the next kingdom that comes after Babylon mm -hmm. is the Medes and the Persians. Yes. We see it in Daniel chapter 5. We see it in Daniel chapter 8. We don't have to go very far to know that. We know this bear symbolizes the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. Just as the bear was raised up high on one side, so between the Medes and the Persians, which was an alliance between the, the kingdom of Media and the kingdom of Persia, the Persians, although they came a little later, they aligned themselves with the Medes, but Persia was the stronger of the two nations, which is why we see the bear raised up on one side. And of course, also Daniel chapter 8, we see the, this ram with two horns, mm. what we're told is Media and Persia. And of course, one horn is higher than the other. So there's no doubt who this yeah. is. The three ribs yeah. in the mouth of the bear, of course, yeah. scholars agree, uh, even though the Bible doesn't explicitly or, or clearly say that they believe that these are the three nations in which uh, Medo-Persia had to overcome in order to become the superpower of the world, which would be Lydia and of course, Babylon and Egypt. Verse 6, we're trucking along here. We come to this leopard. Now, is a leopard faster than a lion or a lion faster than a leopard? A leopard oh. faster. Okay, so a leopard would be faster, right? So you see here that not only does, is, this, is this animal swifter than a lion, but we also see that it has a double set of wings communicating even faster and swifter uh, conquest of conquering the known yeah. world at the time. Yes. And we know that it was the nation of Greece that came after the Medes and the Persians with the leadership of Alexander the Great. He conquered the whole Near East from Egypt all the way to the Indus Valley of India in just three years. I mean, that's just impeccable. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar, get this, Nebuchadnezzar took 13 years to just reach a stalemate with the, kingdom, with the kingdom of Tyre, but Alexander conquered it in just eight months. So this just this communicates the power yes. of this indeed. And of course, the four heads on this leopard would represent the four generals mm -hmm. uh, in which the, 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 right. the kingdom of Greece was passed on to as the kingdom was divided into four parts. But then we get down here to this last kingdom, the fourth kingdom, verse 7, of course, we know historically would be the kingdom of Rome, no doubt. Much as that the toes on that, on that image, Brother Kenny, yes. that we had 10 toes representing the 10 divisions of Rome in 476 AD. Well, Rome divided, that is indeed. And, and also we have the legs of iron, which represents the kingdom of Rome. What type of teeth did this fourth beast have? Iron. It had iron teeth yes. and it had 10 horns upon its head. So we have 10 toes, Again, correlating with the ten horns, the ten divisions of Rome. And what we're going to see at this point as we transition over into Pastor Loma King and Shelley, we're going to see as we go through this study, now God is going to expand this teaching from what he went from Daniel 2 to Daniel 7. Now he's going to add to this prophecy as he's going to take us in through a study and, and he's going to hit the zoom button on the camera and he's going to zoom in on the head of this fourth beast and we're going to see that this little horn appears and causes all kinds of trouble for God. God's kingdom. Amen. Pastor Loma King. Amen. Wow, I tell you, the little horn, Daniel 7, verse 8. Let's peek at that very quickly. Mm -hmm. Daniel brings into, and I like the fact that you pointed out we're getting now into es eschatological, right. apocalyptic areas that are now projecting itself far beyond Daniel's day, mm -hmm. but also includes events and kingdoms of Daniel's day. Uh, Daniel 7, and verse 8. Mm -hmm. I was considering the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, well. coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Mm. And there in this horn were the eyes, were eyes like the eyes of a man, mm. man in a mouth speaking pompous words. Instead of saying great words, the word pompous is really more instrumental there, because the pompous words that were speaking, that were being spoken by this little horn, uh, indicates its greatness, its, its territorial uh, uniqueness, mm. its bombastic nature. Mm. Uh, so just to repeat and enlarge, 
you find that it's described clearly here. When this little horn came up, three horns were plucked out. Mm -hmm. Not just plucked out, but they were plucked out by the roots. That's right. And when you follow the development of the uh, age of antiquity, you find that uh, there's a phrase in history called all roads lead to Rome. Rome. Yeah. All roads lead to Rome. That's right. To reiterate, Rome is pictured here as a, a voice coming up. And in pagan Rome, this is symbolizing the rise of a voice that comes out of these 10 nations. But in order for this nation to get full dominance, it has to remove every nation that resists its, ri its mm -hmm. rise. So from 476 to 538, there were wars, three particular nations that fought against, these were called Aryan nations, mm -hmm. the Aryan Brotherhood, and the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. These three nations, they no longer have a, a, a modern terminology. You know, like the French were the Franks, mm. the Lombards were the Italians, the Burgundians were the Germans. So the words back then, they called them the Burgundians, but now we know them as Germany. Or they called them the Franks back then, but now we know them as France, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. The reason why the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths have no modern vernacular, no modern definition is because they were plucked out by the roots. Mm -hmm. And in 538, that began the dominant reign of the papal state of Rome. 476, the transition from the pagan to the papal was the battle that took place because it also points out, if we go to Daniel chapter 7, and starting with verse 19, mm -hmm. let's look at some of the further descriptions. And by the way, when Ryan pointed out in Daniel 7:17. 7, how we can know these four kings are four kingdoms, it starts out by saying that in verse 19. And it points out here, I'm looking at it, it says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled how much? The residue with its feet. And I want to point out down as we get further, we'll see a more, greater description here. But um, let me just go ahead and read it and I'll break it down as we go on. In verse 20, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and about the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than its fellows. Mm -hmm. So it shows you clearly that um, this, this power that rose, it was above, it was more prominent, it was more stout, it was more uh, resilient, and it was more powerful mm -hmm. because this rising is becoming more stout. All the other nations represented political powers, mm -hmm. but this one was different. Mm -hmm. The Bible says what made it different? When Rome came into existence, Rome came into existence, a merging of the pagan with the papal, mm -hmm. a pagan nation with papal qualities or a papal nation with pagan qualities, whichever mm -hmm. way you choose. It was a nation that did not become converted. It was not a power that abandoned paganism, but a power that gave a religious tinge to paganism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you find today that many of the things that exist in Christendom, they exist because paganism gifted them to, to the papal church mm -hmm. or to Christianity through the papal church. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and find out a little bit more about this. And uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna digress a little bit well. because it says, describing, I was watching verse 21, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them mm -hmm. until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High mm -hmm. and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now this is important because this fourth beast or this fourth uh, beast with the horn coming up out of the ten nations represents the kingdom of Rome. But the Bible goes on to say, this nation will war against the saints of the Most High yes. and for 1,260 years, Rome ruthlessly tried to stamp out Christianity mm -hmm. because it did not resemble the pattern that Rome decided to establish. So you had Rome and then it added a religious component to it 
which later we know as Catholicism, the word Catholic mean universal. Right. So there was a, this was a universal church. But its beliefs, when you think about uh, some of the ways that these beliefs came into existence, uh, the emperors didn't, didn't choose the Bible above tradition. They chose tradition above the Bible. Oh, yeah. They didn't choose to abandon paganism. They chose to baptize paganism. And the battle really was against the rise of Christianity as compared to the rise of paganism, which, in fact, if you go back to it the ver from the very beginning, this is Satan opposing God. Yes. Of course. So he right. chose his earthly power to oppose God. And that's why Paul the Apostle says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God that's or right. all that is worshipped. Really, the issue is once again worship. Mm -hmm. Let's go down to verse 23. And I wish I had a little bit more time because, you know, I'm just <laughs> resonating here. I feel like a race car in a phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, he said in verse 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. There you go, the connection between king and kingdom. Mm -hmm. On the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. This was a prognostication of the future dominance of this kingdom. Because until this particular point, Rome had reigned supreme, as we said, all roads led to Rome, but it did not yet take on a worldwide dominance. And when we go on further in our study, we'll find that Rome is going to, it assumes itself all the way to the very end of human history. Here's how we know. The vision that Daniel was given and the vision that Nebuchadnezzar was given, in both cases, you find the Iron Kingdom was also prevalent in the toes of the image. Mm. We'll talk about that later on. Right. But you have the beast with iron teeth that tramples and breaks all the residue mm. and it devours the whole earth. That is where we are in the pages of history today. You might ask yourself the question, how does the Roman pontiff have such influence? Well, Revelation says that the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Oh. You might ask your question, why does he, how does he get the platform of the speaking to Congress in the United States? Because the United States is the one nation in the world that, stills, that still offers its citizens religious liberty. That's right. Now, Paul, uh, the Pope believes in liberty because in the liberty that we have in America, it gives him the platform to advance his cause. But there has been, since 1994, a merging right. between evangelicals and Catholics to try to make up the largest political and voting bloc in our nation mm -hmm. to control the political outcome of our nation. So when you begin to see what Daniel says here, keep this in mind, when the merger is complete, and as Revelation says in Revelation chapter 13, the second part, Rome will now merge with the political powers of our nation, and our nation will establish an image to the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. Right. That's where we're headed as a nation. Yeah. So this is about to be fulfilled. I mean, there's going to be explosion politically and religiously that we have not seen ever since the Dark Ages. And the very persecuting powers that dominated the Dark Ages mm -hmm. once again will come to the forefront as he causes the earth and those who dwell therein to do two things. Mm -hmm. Worship, and secondly, if you choose not to, you'll be killed. Mm. But you know what? Like Daniel, I'd rather go to the den with Christ mm. than compromise against Christ outside the den. That's right. I'd rather be in the fire with him as the three Hebrews and be delivered than avoid the flames and lose my salvation. Mm. Those who stand with Christ, he stands with them. Mm -hmm. And as ruthless as this nation is pictured, the Bible says the time came for the saints of the Most High to possess the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Revelation talks about a strong kingdom, but God, king, God's kingdom is even more powerful. That's right. Amen. 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 Yeah. Praise the Lord. Wow. Yeah. I love listening to you, Pastor John. Yeah. I think I've said it before. It's like drinking from a fire hydrant. You just wow. want more and more. Praise, Praise the God. Lord for the ministry of Pastor Lord. Lord. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll be. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a few moments. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Hello and welcome back to 3B and Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Miss Shelley Quinn at this time for Tuesday's lesson. Ooh, I love my lesson. I just hope I can get it all in. Um, mine is the court was seated. Daniel 7 presents a panoramic prophetic view of the time from Daniel till the time of the end. And I guarantee you this is the most comprehensive detailed prophecy in the Old Testament. When after Daniel sees the four animals and the little horn power coming up, his vision flashes forward and he sees this divine throne in heaven mm -hmm. from which judgment will come. I think personally, I believe that Daniel 7 is the most significant chapter of mm -hmm. Daniel. Mm -hmm. And what we find in verses 9 through 14, we're going to have three scenes that come in rapid fire succession that are some of the most important eschatological verses mm -hmm. in Daniel. So let's look. Daniel 7 verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. The ancient of days is referring to God mm -hmm. and his eternal nature. Mm -hmm. You think about it. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit. First Timothy 1, 17, Paul mm -hmm. talks about him being immortal, invisible. And in first Timothy 6, 16, he says, God alone has immortality. Mm -hmm. And the reason we know what God is like is because Colossians 1.15 says Christ is the image mm -hmm. of the right. invisible God. So this is the, uh, the God the Father, the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. This is symbolic of, it, of his holiness, his purity and his righteousness. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. Pure wool was the whitest of wool. And I think this is indicating and symbolic of his eternality, his purity and his wisdom. And then it says his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Well, when you think about these flaming fire wheels. There's just no limitations or restrictions to God's righteous judgment. Verse 10, Daniel 7, 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. This conveys the righteous wrath of his judgment. Mm -hmm. When you think Psalm 97, 3 says, a fire goes before him and burns up his foes on every side. Mm -hmm. So Daniel's seeing all of this and he says, a thousand thousands ministered to him, 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. This is the angels. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we know this is referencing the angels, right. even in Revelation 5, 11, when it's talking about hearing the voice of many angels mm -hmm. and the number of them was thousand times 10,000, etc. Mm -hmm. So then he says, the court was seated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is judgment time. The books were open. Mm -hmm. I think Daniel is seeing both the investigative and the executive judgment here. But when you think of the books were open, there was the book of life, the book of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people forget the statue book, mm -hmm. which is the Bible. I mean, this is how we will be judged. Je Jesus said it's by the word, right? Verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words these are prideful, mm -hmm. pompous words which the horn was speaking. Mm -hmm. I watched till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Mm -hmm. Reminds me, and I think you made uh, allusion to this, of 2 Thessalonians mm -hmm. 2. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. It says that Paul writes to the Thessalonians, said that day will not come until the man of sin is revealed, the son of of perdition mm -hmm. who opposes mm -hmm. and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. Mm -hmm. How pompous can you get? So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Right. Verse eight says, then the lawless one will be revealed That's whom right. the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth 
and destroy with the brightness mm. of his coming. Mm. You know, it makes you go back to, to Daniel 2, when the stone that's not cut out by hands comes and smashes that image and everything to pieces. So Revelation 19:20 says that the beast and the false prophet are going to be cast into the lake of fire. So that goes with uh, Daniel 7:11 there where it says its bodies were destroyed and given to the burning flame. All right. Verse 12. Daniel 7, verse 12. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. The first three beasts, Babylon, uh, Babylon Medo-Persia, and Greece in chapters 2 and 7, in spite of losing dominion, they continued on as and existed as a kingdom I mean, as part of the kingdom that conquered them, That's right? right? Mm -hmm. So they were amalgamated into the empire, as it were, of those who conquered them. And, you know, I think that that's what, when you look at this beast, Revelation 13, 1 through 2, the sea beast with the ten heads, horns, crowns, blasphemous name, mm -hmm. it says, the beast was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet right. of the lion. I mean, bear, the mouth like the mouth of the lion. So he's seeing these kingdoms in reverse here, but they've been amalgamated and the dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. So they're still surviving the final Roman phase in mm -hmm. some sense until the coming of Christ when the whole world will be depopulated. Mm -hmm and Christ's kingdom will replace it. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Mm -hmm. Two persons take center stage here. Right. One like the son of man and the ancient of days. The son of man is none other than the last Adam, the only one that could stand in the presence of the Lord, the divine Messiah himself. And he is standing, he's being ushered before his father. You know, son of man is a title that was used 69 times in the synoptic gospels, mm. uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and 12 times in John. It was one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. Let me read Mark 14. 61 and 62, he, speaking of Jesus, kept silent and answered nothing. And the high priest again asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Mm -hmm. Listen to what Jesus says. I am. I am that I am. I am and you will see the son of man mm -hmm. sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Amen. You know what's important for us to note is that this judgment occurs after the 1260 year period. Yes. That's, that's so important. It's after the Little Horns activities, 538 to 1798. <laughs> but it's prior to God establishing his kingdom, right? So we see three times in this oh. sequence that the little horn phase, and then the heavenly judgment, and then God's eternal kingdom. Mm -hmm. So this is it's really important for us to understand this. So let's look at Daniel 7 and verse 14, because I want to get to the end of this. Then to him, speaking of the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, mm -hmm. which shall not pass away. His kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. Amen. Only Christ is worthy to receive this kingdom. And the Ancient of Days gives him this universal Amen. kingdom. Right. Verse 21, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So the persecuting power is still trying to execute and exterminate God's people mm. until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion.
talking of the little horn power, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. consume and destroy it forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Boy, that kind of gives you a little bit of chills, I think. Mm -hmm. Goosebumps. Amen. You see the prophecy and things opening up. I have uh, Wednesday's lesson. It's the coming of the Son of Man. So <clears throat> I have one Bible passage. <laughs> Sister Shelley covered it rather well. You have one but I'm going to go right back into it. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to do Daniel 7, verse 13. Okay. And there's more that can be said about that, I'm sure. But uh, we'll just ask the Holy Spirit to help us with it. I'm going to read it. It says, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came into the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. As we read this verse here, and we can look at the words, it says, one like the Son of Man. Now, in the Aramaic, it says, like a Son of Man, or like a man. So here it's kind of backing away a little bit and describing and looking at who it's really talking about Amen. here and Amen. some characteristics and some qualities of this individual that's being talked about here. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at that just a little bit here. The normal order you look at a, a prophetic a narrative is for the prophet, whoever's writing the prophet first, is to describe what he has seen. Mm. He describes right. and then he goes back and then he begins to describe uh, uh, or, or identify that thing or individual, whatever it might be in here. So we're going to kind of look that God chose to present his son as a, in a prophetic vision. Now, how did he do it? He, he, he wanted to emphasize humanity, the humanity of Christ. Amen. And I think that's something we read, need to really look at closely here, Amen. the humanity of Jesus Christ, because he's taking my place. Amen. And how can he take my place if he's not fully human? Now, <laughs> we hear those arguments all the time. He had an edge. He had things that we can't have. And that's certainly not true as we, we look at Scripture here. Let's go back to the incarnation for just a moment of the Son of God. Remember, he took on himself the form of what? Of humanity. That's right. He became the son of man. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in John chapter 1, you know it well. We'll read verses 1 through 4 quickly. Here's what the Bible says. In the beginning was the Word. John chapter 1, 1 through 4. Beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. God. The same was in, with, in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. made. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, in him, I love this, in him was life, and the life was the light, light. of men. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Those That's verses right. are just absolutely powerful when, when you look at them in John uh, 1, 1 through 4. It says here, there's a couple of points I want to bring out here. Number one is Jesus existed from eternity. Amen. Right. All eternity. And there never was a time that Christ right. was never with God. There That's just never right. was a time. This is a debate that goes on and on and on. Like he came into an existence sometime in a point. It, it, the Bible is very clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's right. Isn't that what it says? That's right. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That's right. So who of us is a challenge when the beginning Except mm. we just believe by faith, he's always been with. So that's yeah. what the Bible talks right. about we just, so we, as we look at that here. And, then, and remember, too, that Jesus is a distinct, distinct Absolutely. person. That's right. Yet he's one with what? Yeah. He's wow. one with the Father. So those that's things right. that we need to look at closely. Point two, Jesus had two natures. Good. You know, it's good. What do you have? He had the divine nature right. and he had the human nature. Now, let's get a description of the divine nature or from, from Scripture in uh, Philippians 2, verse 6. Mm -hmm. It says, Who being in the form of God mm -hmm. thought it not robbery to be, what's the word? Equal. Equal with God. Notice this right here. So, And he was, in Hebrews 1, 3, the Bible says, He was the brightness and the glory yes. and the express image of His person. Yes, that amen. tells you that talk about description of his divinity. Now let's get a description of his humanity. Philippians 2 verse 8, the Bible said, He was made in the what? Appearance. The likeness of men being formed in fashion as a man. Mm -hmm. I love this. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Hmm. Mm -hmm. be, and and that, I think this is what he would have for us, that we love him, we come have such a connection with him, we would be willing to be obedient unto death. In other words, we, in, in our life, we, we want to come to the point in time to where we had rather die than knowingly sin. Now, that's an mm. awesome statement. That's, We'd that's rather powerful. die than knowingly sin. That's right. And God has promised and helped us to do that. And, of course, Jesus is our example. So here we have this 
individual is talking about here that we just read about. He clothed himself, right? He clothed his divinity with humanity. Mm. So we look at it. He was at all times, I just, at all times while he was here, he was still God. Amen. Of course. Well, he was here. See, some people just disagree with that. But all the time he was here, he was still God. Right. He clothed his divinity with humanity. Right. Awesome. That's right. God became man. Yes. That's right. And he assumed, now listen to this, he assumed man's fallen, sinful nature That's right. without taking on the sin. Amen. Yeah. That's okay? Right. It's Amen. very important that we understand why is there so much confusion sometime in the religious world, even yeah. in our own? Every one of you here has been through that. What nature did he take? You know? That's right. If he took the nature of, of Adam, we're in trouble. That's when right. he came down this world after 4,000 years of sin, that's where he took it, where the condition of the world was after 4,000 years. That's our, that's our Christ. That's our Jesus. That's the one who said, I want to know everything about it. I want to, I've, I've come and I've taken in this position after 4,000 years. That's good. So now let me read something else here. Manuscript 143 1897 says, by taking upon himself man's nature in its woo, fallen condition, right? he was subject to the infirmities and the weakness of the flesh. Now, that's pretty powerful. Of course. And when you say this, and I've gotten letters, and some of you probably have too. Now, maybe I should take my glasses off on this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to waste time with it. But it, it's at least point. You, you, you get letters that say, well, that's that's... When, when Jesus came down here, this one that we're reading about here in the book of Daniel in 7 verse 13, when he appeared on the scene. That's right. You know, there was a reason he appeared on the scene and the reason he appeared with, appeared as heavenly father. It was not his second coming, my time is running down, that he was talking about here. It's his moving, you see, mm -hmm. his moving to the most holy place where his father was at to receive his kingdom, just to That's give you right. a little point. But we, you know, we believe this with our whole heart. When Jesus came down here, accepted humanity and the liabilities of it, it was with the possibility that he would never go back to heaven. That's right. I know that's controversial, but still yet, because oh, yeah. if he had fallen, that's if he had right. sinned even in thought, he would have never went back to heaven. Mm -hmm. And people just can't grasp that. Mm. But it, oh. is, it, it, did he take the human nature? Yes. Yes, he did. He yes, sure he did. did. And so, I mean, to me, that just, instead of challenging that, it makes me love him more. To be oh, honest. amen. That makes amen. me love him more to say, he, and I have no idea what he threw up and what he left up there in heaven, as it were. What he left, we can only read about. We can only maybe dream about. And, and then the eye has not seen, ear has heard. So it's not even entered our heart. What he gave up when he's seen a miserable creature like me. And he said, there's something special. When he looked at you, he said, there's something special. That's right. And I'm willing to give this up. Mm. How many of us are willing to give up on anything in here, any even comfort? Amen. Well, it's a little cold. I don't want to go out and give a Bible study tonight. Well, it's cold. I don't want to go to prayer meeting. <laughs> well, it's cold. It might be raining. <laughs> Preach it, brother. The weather report says there's 50% chance of rain. I'm not going to get off of that. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Excuses, excuses. He left the courts of heaven. And he came down here with the possibility of never going back. It makes me weep. Almost think about yes, right now. I, right. I, it's just it blows my mind. I say, thank you, Lord. I'm glad I'm Amen. thankful that Amen. you did. Amen. Coming of the Son of Man here is not referring. We mentioned the second coming in the clouds of heaven, not coming from heaven to earth, but is moving from one place in heaven to another that we're talking about here. To ooh, I love it when you said it appeared before the Ancient of Days. Mm. We talk about this. Ooh, two powers coming together. How does, how does the universe stand it almost? Right. You know, yeah. it's such power coming together. This reminds us of a description of the high priest. You remember on the day of atonement, he had this cloud of incense all around him. He yeah. enters the most holy place on the day of atonement. What was he doing? He's performing the purification of the sanctuary. Yes. Right. What's going on in heaven? Then we're talking about a judgment here. We're talking mm -hmm. about powers that's, it, that's involved here. That's right. It's trying to tear down the Word of God and trying to make sure there's not a cleansing of the sanctuary, you know. So we realize it's all going to happen. It's all going to take place, praise God. The Son of Man is also royal. I'm so glad you read verse 14. It shows this man that was talking about there was coming in at the Ancient of Days. He's royal because it says there in, in Daniel 7, verse 14, there was given to him dominion and glory and kingdom and power and nations and yeah. language should woo, serve him. And his kingdom shall not, what? It shall not pass away. Ooh, I'm mm. running out of time. <laughs> 
All will serve him. And serve him can be translated, that word translated is worship him. Many okay. times I give you illustrations that the chapters 1 through 7 appears nine different times. You realize Daniel 3 verse 12, Daniel 3 17 is talking about serving their gods. But it's talking about worship. Amen. Pastor John mentioned this is deals mm-hmm. with worship and who right. we worship. Make sure we worship the right one. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Kenny. Aren't you grateful? that Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thank you. What a powerful study, each one of you. We talked about the four beasts in, Mm. I was going to say Revelation. I don't know where I got that from. The four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn power, the judgment scene taking place there in heaven and who Jesus is. And I think my day is the, my favorite one mm-hmm. because I get to talk about the saints of the Most High, mm-hmm. the holy ones of the Amen. Most High. This is about you and I. All of this concerns us, but this most definitely concerns us because it's yeah. about us. Amen. We're going to talk about the dominion of the saints of the Most High and the persecution that mm-hmm. the saints of the Most High will need to endure. Oh, wow have endured during this time of little horn power and will endure again in the future. But first, we want to look at the back of the book. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. We're going to start there and then we'll go back to Daniel 7. Because the back of the book says, we win. Verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Who's they? This is the saints of the Most High. Overcame him. Who's him? Mm -hmm. Satan. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. We know Revelation 12, 7 says, War broke out in heaven, and Christ fought against Satan, and Satan did not win, and he was cast down to the earth. Mm -hmm. And ever since that time, there has been this thing we call the great controversy. Mm -hmm. But we know that Christ is victorious, and the saints will be victorious as well. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So let's talk about the dominion of the saints. Daniel 7, verse 18. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom even forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And then jump down to verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to whom? Mm -hmm. The people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now we know you just read Pastor Kenny Daniel 7, 14, Mm -hmm. that to him, that's the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. But here we see that the saints will be given dominion. In the beginning, Adam had dominion. Is that not true? The first Adam. I'm talking about all the way in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So Mm. Adam was given dominion, as it were, over this earth. But then sin entered the world. Mm. And through that, the dominion was lost. Through that, Adam, as it were, gave dominion over to Satan, who Mm. claimed to be the prince of this world. Mm. But we know in Romans 4, 5, verse 18 and 19, Mm. that the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man Mm. and Son of God, that he wrested that dominion from Satan and restored it. Verses 18 and 19 of Romans 5. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. That's through Adam's sin, we lost that dominion, resulting in condemnation. Mm -hmm. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Mm -hmm. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ Mm, shall all be made alive. We know Christ restored that dominion at the cross. John 12, he's looking forward to the cross at this point. John 12, 31 and 32. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men and women unto (laughs) myself. So, Christ received, or we could say bought back, as it were, the dominion. 
that man had lost in the beginning. And then we will be given that dominion as saints, which is incredible. I, I think about Revelation chapter 5, the enthronement of the Lamb. This is right mm -hmm. after AD 31 when Christ ascends to the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. And it says in verses 9 and 10, they sing a new song. Mm -hmm. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us, that's yes. the saints of the Most High, that's right. kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. Hallelujah. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the saints of the Most High are given dominion again yeah, because right. Christ was victorious at the cross mm -hmm. and we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But even though that is coming, this dominion is coming, there is this time of persecution mm -hmm. that the saints go through, the persecution of the saints of the Most High. In verse 20, we're going back to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 20. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, Pastor John already talked about that, mm -hmm. namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. This is none other than the little horn power mm -hmm. that Pastor John talked mm -hmm. about. The Roman Catholic Church reigning, as it were, from 538 mm -hmm. to 1798, 1260 years of papal supremacy. Mm -hmm. But what happened during that time? Verse 21, mm -hmm. I was watching and the the same horn was making war against the saints mm -hmm. and prevailing against them. We know the papal persecution that the Christians endured, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, mm -hmm. many, many people who wanted to remain true to the word of God who lost their lives. Mm -hmm. It's estimated maybe 50 million people were killed mm -hmm. during that time. And that's yeah taken from a Catholic estimate, other people say much more yeah. were killed than that. Mm -hmm. I think of the cry of those who were persecuted, who were martyred for their right. faith during those years. Mm -hmm. That cry comes up to God. Mm -hmm. I think about the seals. We studied that in Revelation 6, 9 and 10. The fifth seal, when it's opened, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God mm -hmm. and for the testimony which they held. Mm -hmm. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So mm -hmm. during this time of papal persecution, God's right. people were persecuted and they cried out, mm -hmm. God, when is this going to that's end? Right, right. And we yes. know that that persecution that little horn power is going to rise again. We know that clearly from Revelation. Mm. But God is going to deliver his people. Mm. That's right. mm. Daniel 7, 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. God changes everything. Yeah. He possesses all power. He is omnipotent. He possesses all knowledge. He is omniscient. He is everywhere. He yeah. is omnipresent. He is eternal. Yeah. The timeline, I think Shelly, you talked about that. We have the little horn power. Then we have after 1798, this time of heavenly judgment. We get more specific date when we get into Daniel chapter eight. Mm. Then we have God's eternal Hallelujah. kingdom when the saints yeah. possess right. the kingdom and That's will right. reign with Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to leave you with a verse. This is yeah. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Amen. I love this passage of scripture because whether you are enduring persecution or going through a hard of time of hardship, nothing can separate you from Jesus Christ. That's right. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Jump down to verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors mm -hmm. through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, yes. nor height, nor depth, mm -hmm. nor yeah. any other creature yes. shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. Nothing internal mm -hmm. and nothing external mm -hmm. 
that Satan tries to bring against you can separate you from the love of Christ. Mm. That's right. That's I'm right. so grateful yes. that yes. our God sees us right. in our time of need, that he hears us, his ear is open to our cry, mm -hmm. and that yeah. he will bring deliverance That's right. just at the time Amen. when we need it most. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Woo. Great stuff. We may need to call the fire department here in oh, Thompsonville. This panel's on fire. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I love these studies mm -hmm. and the book of Daniel is just so incredible and I just praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to pass it back to the panel at this time for some closing comments. Well, you know, this little horn we talked about is, I want to go back to the actual way God sees it. God showed Daniel a little horn. That's right. Because That's there's no right. horn that can take God's place. That's right. Any horn that attempts to take God's place is a little horn. Because the horns on the altar are the reason why we can be redeemed, why we can be forgiven. God is the horn that rises above all of the That's horns. Right. And when that horn sounds itself at the coming of the Lord, mm. we will see the final vindication above oh. that little horn, no matter how stout he gets, God's kingdom will reign eternally. Amen. amen and amen. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but what's coming to my mind is verse 10. <laughs> it's where it says a fiery stream issued forth. You know, God is, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire and um, it's the love of God. Think of the reason we can't stand before mm -hmm. God right now without the robe of righteousness is because God's love, God is love, and love consumes sin. Mm -hmm. It is the fire of his love that consumes sin. And so just know that the court has been seated. This took place after 1798. The books were open. There is the book of life in which our name was written. There's the book of remembrance that the angels are keeping. But we've got to remember Jesus mm -hmm. said that this word is what we will That's be right. judged by. Yeah. So there is a standard that God keeps. And don't be afraid of judgment because you've got an advocate in heaven mm -hmm. and judgment is in favor of God's people. That's right. Oh, that's, that's good. I like that. But we are in the hour of God's judgment. That's right. We do have an advocate. You know, and if we have chosen Christ, the, the uh, words come back from Zechariah uh, 3 verse 4. Mm -hmm. It says, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, and I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. James 1, 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation or endures trial. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So it might seem like you're enduring this time of persecution, but endure to the end. Amen. and you will receive the crown of life. Amen. Mm. Praise yeah. the Lord. I appreciate each and every one of you and your comments and, and what the Lord is doing through you to witness to the world. And I, you know, you can't study a passage like this, a chapter like this, and not sense the urgency yes. that Jesus is coming soon. I mean, you can read right. these chapters, these prophetic themes and, and symbols, and, and you can have all that information. But at the end of the day, I sense that there's a, just an ultimate call from the Lord saying, I'm coming. Amen. I'm on my way. I've told you in my word. I've foretold it. Be ready, be watchful. Anyways, that brings us to the conclusion of our program this week. We hope that you get to join us next week because next week's study, we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 8 and we're going to be talking about from contamination to purification. And so God bless you. It's a blessing to have you. We hope to see you next week.